We go, well, wait a minute. The the we got a player inbounds touching the ball, a player out of bounds touching the ball. Hello, everybody. We're back again. Another episode of the Basketball Rules Expert, the YouTube show where we take National Federation of High School rules, lift them off the printed page, breathe life into them, simplify, clarify, amplify, and then give them back to you in a format you could take with you onto the basketball court where it is most important. Greetings again, everybody. My name is Greg Austin. I'm a basketball official here in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I have been for over a decade. I consider myself to be a basketball rules expert. This show is all about helping you on your journey to becoming a basketball rules expert as well. Before we get started today, I have to give a shout out to show supporters, Dick Schmidt, Ed Knags, Jose Lansang Jr., and Owen Lamborn. Much appreciated and much love. If you want to support the show, there will be a link in the show notes below. Today, we're going to get started with something different, a mailbag episode. We're going to answer viewer questions from previous episodes and about basketball rules in general. If you want to submit a question for a future episode, there will be a link in the show notes below. All right, let's get started today with our very first question. Laker fan 0852 via YouTube. If player A1 throws an alley oop to A2 who catches the ball directly over the rim in the imaginary cylinder, is this offensive basket interference? In a word, yes. Yes, it is. Basket interference does not require that the contacting of the ball in the imaginary cylinder would be a part of a try for goal. It could be a pass. It could be a throw-in pass. It could be a pass from a player on the court. But it doesn't require that it's a try. And contacting the ball while it is in the imaginary cylinder by either team contacting the ball is a basket interference violation by rule. Roger Meyer asks, in a previous video, you made an error about what the timeout area boundaries are. Maybe issue a correction. Roger, thank you. Thank you. We absolutely misspoke in a video about the timeout area, and the timeout area is important. It's the 28-foot line to the end line, the nearest lane line, and the bench area. That defines the timeout area for teams to be in during a timeout. Roger, thank you so much for pointing it out. Much appreciated and much love. Next question. Danny Chapman via YouTube asks, My son was refing and he had this last week. A1 shot the ball. B1 slaps the backboard to show off. Ball does not go in. He called a technical and the basket good. Is that correct? As we discussed in our episode where we, discuss, where we covered this, it is a commonly misapplied rule. The slapping of the backboard, while it may be deemed a player technical by the official, cannot be ruled basket interference or goaltending. So the slapping of the backboard has no effect on it for either of those rules. So, your son was very likely correct in assessing the technical foul, but not correct in scoring the goal by rule. Hey, if we could stop here just for a second. If you find value in the content, hit that like button below. Super helpful when it comes to the YouTube algorithm. Helps our show get in front of more basketball officials so that we can all get better together. Thanks so much. From Kenny Mock, Kenny asks, is it possible for me to send you clips of plays to have you review them? Well, that's a good question. You can always send us clips of plays to abetterofficial.com slash submit clips. Two words, submit clips. All one word, submit clips. Abetterofficial.com slash submit clips. We'll put a link in the show notes below. Look forward to seeing your plays, Kenny. 
Next up today, May 2759 via YouTube asks, is the division line in the front court or the back court or neither? You know, it's a simple question, but it's a really good question. Where could we find the answer? Our good friend, Rule 4, Section 13, defines court areas. Article 1, a team's front court consists of that part of the court between its end line and the nearer edge of the division line, including its basket and the inbounds part of the backboard. That would be five of the six sides of the backboard. Article 2, here's our definition. A team's backcourt consists of the rest of the court, including the entire division line and the opponent's basket and inbounds part of the opponent's backboard. So by rule, the division line is always in the backcourt. If Team A has the ball, the division line is in their backcourt. And if Team B has the ball, the division line is in their backcourt. It changes status from A to B, but it's always by rule in the backcourt. Great question. Let's move on now. Super supporter Tony Dye via YouTube asks, if a team warning for delay has already been issued and later, during a throw-in, the defense reaches across the boundary line a second time and contacts the basketball, it will result in a player technical foul. But do they also get a team technical for violating the plane after a team warning for delay had been given? And that is an excellent question. And in our video on technical fouls, where we covered this, we left it open that I don't know the answer to that. It makes sense that that would also be deserving of a technical foul. It doesn't seem that there would be two technicals assessed, but I left it open. But to the rescue comes Dennis Hall via YouTube. Dennis points out that there's a case play that covers this very question. Case play 10.4.1, situation D. A1 is out of bounds for a throw in. B1 reaches through the boundary plane and knocks the ball out of A1's hands. Earlier in the game, Team B had received a team warning for delay. That's our play scenario that Tony brings up. The ruling, though, even though Team B has already issued a warning for team delay, when B1 breaks the plane and subsequently contacts the ball in the thrower's hand, it is considered to be the same act, and the end result is penalized. A player technical foul is assessed to be one for contacting the basketball. Two free throws and a division line throw in for Team A will follow. The previous warning for team delay still applies with any subsequent team delay resulting in a team technical foul. So that clarifies the situation completely. And we owe a huge thank you to Dennis Hall via YouTube for pointing that fact out. Uh, feedback is always welcomed on our video. The whole idea is that we can all get better together. Jeff Wright via YouTube. Wouldn't the ball be dead as soon as the defender reached through the boundary plane? So only the team technical for a second delay would be penalized and not the foul. So that's referring to our previous play that Tony brought up where a player reaches through. But let's think it through. We just had a case play that said in this instance, we don't go back in time and say, okay, well, once they broke the plane, the ball was dead for a team delay. We don't do that. We wait to see the result of the play. Now, if we gave the ball to the, at the disposal of a thrower and a player, the defensive player swiped across the boundary line and missed, right? And the official's just about to rule a violation and they come again and the whistle sounds just prior, you know, et cetera, just prior to the contacting of the ball, then we could, in theory, have before I contacted the ball, I have a dead ball, warning for delay, team technical, off we go, right? It, that scenario could exist. But if the, in that brief amount of time, the official's not allowed, to, uh, not able to make that ruling, then the ruling stands. 
on that play. Thanks for the question, Jeff. Nafur writes, must you give a warning before issuing a technical foul? Right? This is a common question. NFHS actually came out with a clarification to clarify that officials are not required to issue a warning prior to issuing a technical foul. However, they may issue a warning when the offense is judged to not be major. The rationale is to clarify the official does not have to give a warning to the coach. The warning is one of the tools used to help improve behavior before a technical foul is given. It is not necessary. It is just a tool that the officials have to help deal with potential problems with a coach or the bench. If the coach is deserving of a technical foul, we do not have to give them a warning first. It's as simple as that. Their actions, if they warrant a technical foul, receive a technical foul. Now, if the officials feel that they could use a warning to help address behavior that's approaching be deserving of a technical foul, then they can use that tool. It's a fantastic tool that we have at our availability and one that has really made the game better. Dan Grandgood via YouTube asks, how can a foul of any kind be called after the horn sounds to end the game? In general, at the end of the game, Officials are making their way off the court. Now, I know in some parts of the country, there are requirements that officials potentially stay for handshakes or some post-game activity of some sort. But in most instances across the country, game ends, officials are leaving. Okay. That being said, officials cannot disregard egregious behavior by a coach or a player. It's super easy to imagine a scenario, right? Where the coach, uh, you know, comes at the officials and pushes them. We're not gonna assess a technical foul? That's a flagrant technical. Maybe the game has ended, maybe it has no bearing on the game, but we're going to assess that technical foul. We have the power to assess that foul, technical foul after the fact. So. We can, uh, if the technical foul will affect the outcome of the game and could lead to possibly overtime or changing the result of the game, we're going to stop, come back, and assess that technical foul, shoot the appropriate free throws, and go through the proper procedures. But it's possible. It's not too hard to imagine a scenario where a player or a, a team member or the head coach or an assistant coach just does something absolutely egregious and can't be ignored. Thanks, Dan. Dave Rush via YouTube. In reality, how many officials will tee someone up after the horn where the offending team is up by two? It's happened. It will happen again. I, I had an instance at the end of a uh, collegiate game where that exact scenario came to pass, or we were on the verge of that exact same scenario. Head coach who won by two, comes at the crew, questioning, accusing, etc. right? Now, what's our motivation as officials? Well, why don't we stick it around and hash this out and maybe we can get a tactical foul go? No. Our motivation is, this game is over, we're leaving. But if the coach provides no opportunity for that by doing something so egregious, absolutely, by rule, tactical foul would be deserved and we would administer and see what happens in the game. Absolutely, 100%. It's going to happen again. Thanks, Dave. Thank you for joining us today for the Basketball Rules Expert Mailbag Edition. If you find value in the content, time to do all the things like subscribe, hit notify, and share the video content with others. Special thanks again today to our show supporters, Dick Schmidt, Ed Knags, Jose Lansang Jr., and Owen Lomborn. Much appreciated. 
and much love. If you want to be a supporter of the show, you can always buy us a coffee. There's a link above and in the show notes below, or just head over to betterofficial.com slash coffee. All right. We have additional video content for you here. Make your choice. Choose wisely. Tell you what, we'll see you in the very next video. Take care.